uh, since that we are on the same topic like i would uh, like to uh, share like a recent blog post which i read about like how gitlab um, uh, planned their migration from uh, postgres 9.6 to uh, postgres 11 uh, so they have written a detailed blog post i thought like i i would be uh, it would be useful for everyone to go through that blog post i will explain a little bit of the planning what they have done in one or two minutes and then we can uh, go ahead after that to discuss the like, how do normally people uh, plan their migration some or their upgrades uh, to a, uh, newer versions So you can access this uh, blog post uh, in the gitlab.com. So I'm going to paste the link in the chat. Uh, so it becomes easier for others also to follow. Uh, so the it, it's a bit lengthy uh, blog post. So what GitLab wanted to do like in their latest version, they want to upgrade from uh, Postgres 9.6 to Postgres 11. And this uh, migration uh, is not only technical decision the team has taken, they also found a business reason why they should migrate from the 9.6 to uh, 11. Of course, one main reason being there's end of life coming. The other thing is like they had a lot of features which will help them for their business to scale and a lot of other operations connected with that. Uh, so how did they plan uh, this, this entire migration and uh, what tools did they use and how did their uh, day of migration look like and uh, and you, we, they also recorded the entire process of migration on that particular day and they released this at, as a youtube video so it becomes easier for people to go and view like how they did it in a period of say two to three hours so so for some details I've given is like their, what is their cluster size? What is the number of transaction they do? Uh, from scale of it, it looks like it is like really a big scale uh, because like there is no like one particular day Git, GitLab's uh, uh, usage go to only 10%. It, it looks like they have like over the time, it, it is they, it ranges from 200 and 200,000 transaction to 300,000 transaction. That is, you cannot say like on Sundays, it's going to be less. On Mondays, it's going to be high. So it is more like the traffic and the distribution looks like equally distributed. As a result, there is no easy way for them to migrate unless they give some kind of a, a say two or three hour window to the customer as possible early. And they put up the reason why they want to move away from Postgres 9.6 to Postgres 11. And you can see some technical details for that. And the next part is like they have detailed about how is their infrastructure running and you can see like the infrastructure is like it is running in a cluster based setup which with more than like six machines at, uh, and uh, you can see the number of cores to 96 cpu cores it is really a large uh, setup setup machine and they're using like all the things required for load balancing and out leader election everything they've been using and then like they have described uh, their what is their load on average day and how much transaction happens on the busiest star how much transaction happens on the uh, non busiest uh, time so the main thing for them uh, for uh, gitlab is like they are migrating to from uh, 9.6 to 11 at the same time they were very sure that the migration has to go through and they should also plan for the rollback. Let's say in between uh, something goes wrong, they should be able to roll back to 9.6 without any uh, issues. And they also had like a downtime uh, announcement for two to three hours. So the migration has to happen in this particular uh, time frame, and it cannot. Uh, and all the nodes in the cluster cannot uh, lag behind a lot. And as a result, there will be some there is a lag in the uh, what is it the application itself so these were some of the main constraints for gitlab for uh, some of the constraints they need to take into the account and to how did they plan so while reading the blog post it was clear that this is not a kind of a migration where you can do it in like a week or two planning it required more like a month of planning though they have not disclosed how long the entire iteration went for starting from the planning phase to the execution phase uh, if you read through the blog post like it is very clear that it, it is more like developing like a uh, yeah, quarterly plan like 
this quarter what we are going to do so it looks, looks like ops team have developed a proper quarterly plan figuring out like what is going to be our data uh, backup and how are we going to do it in the staging testing and then we are going to run a performance uh, uh, measurements and all the queries which are going to the current system and see if there is no regression or there is no performance penalty and then actually how do we migrate the cluster so they have developed these into multiple phases in the first phase what they did is like they came up with the uh, ansible playbook how they will uh, do this migration and second place is like uh, change the uh, change the development to a staging development with the same production database with some kind of uh, setup environmental setup and once they upgraded from the, the 9.6 to uh, 11 and they did an end to end staging test in that and fourth is like they went for the upgrade upgrade in the uh, production that is like on particular day they figured out this is what we are going to do and some kind of measurements they did what are maintenance announcement and all those uh, details once that is done and they were able to complete in two and a half hours to three and a half hours the, and the important thing to notice like they used a tool called pg upgrade i think the pg upgrade will help you to move from one major version to other major version and the uh, detail uh, explanation they give how this pg upgrade works and it is uh, the main thing to note is during from one postgres uh, version to other postgres version the logical or the data structure uh, or how it is stored in the disks may not change but the metadata information about the tables how they are laid out may be different so that means they are very careful in checking the compatibility of the versions and they did that and then they did a regression uh, test benchmark saying that queries don't, uh, there are no slow queries or there is no performance penalty once they have migrated. Uh, as you can see, they automate, automated everything using the uh, Ansible playbook and they have to do everything like stop the services which are accessing the database like your uh, API servers and your uh, uh, workers, all the other parts. And finally, uh, uh, they upgraded the uh, Postgres on that particular migration day. This is like the traffic where, where you can see like before migration and after migration, it was more like a smooth uh, migration uh, and they had two hours of uh, downtime. And if you see that this entire process, this took like four hours, but the actual migration was only uh, took for two hours. An interesting part is like there was some person who was driving the initiative like when you run certain script you will be asked to enter certain information like yes or no. So if there's someone else reading that and giving the instruction to the person who's actually doing this migration, it becomes easier for the person to um, doing the migration to make any decision because the person is only need to enter the commands, no need to think too much what will happen. Remember what, have, what are the previous uh, answers he has given or she has given. So this is uh, uh, something like uh, interesting for me because they also planned out what if things doesn't go well, that is they have to revert back to the older version and they did this entire, uh, what is a migration uh, on the protection data on a, on a staging environment. So most of the time I have found like very few people or few organization has this kind of resources to plan out the entire migration in advance as well as to able to have a, a dummy play of a production data and trying to see what all problems they can catch in advance. that's the uh, the details of the of the postgres migration and uh, we can have a little bit of discussion about the the migration how people uh, and upgrades uh, they do in their uh, organization and once we are done that uh, at the end i will uh, present a small tool called uh, sql check uh, so sql check is a tool which helps you to find anti pattern in your sql queries and we'll get to that in, in a moment. Before that, I would like to uh, pause for a few, a few seconds and then let's uh, talk about the migrations and upgrades, how uh, you do and uh, what are some good practices you can share. Hi everyone, uh, this is Navarun here. So since Craze brought up uh, the PG upgrade tool, uh, so I, I work at Clarisites and we have five and a half ish terabyte single machine Postgres database. Uh, I'm talking about the size of the primary. Uh, we do have a secondary uh, with uh, logical replication, basically streaming replication, uh, which basically replace everything that we have. 
so we were actually playing back so we were on postgres 10.2 since some time and we wanted to go to like uh, 12.3 uh, because of the improvements there uh, so we did all that uh, playbook thing uh, not writing in an ansible playbook but we actually did literate programming basically in a markdown file we wrote out each of the steps that we will do for the staging process uh, one thing really beautiful about pg upgrades uh, hard link mode is where uh, all of the the actual upgrade took just 3 minutes so 500 five and a half terabytes of database upgraded in 3 minutes uh just that we had to take some precautions even before that uh so we took a hot online backup of the database while it was active uh we are on gcp and the db is running on vm with uh, persistent disks so we just took a hot backup and in between we just took a snapshot of that disk so in any case if anything went wrong uh after the new cluster started basically the pg12 cluster started uh pg upgrade documentation says that you can't revert back because then the pages are rewritten basically the new schema is pg12 uh, pg10 won't understand it anymore so then also like we had this uh, idea that hey uh, even if we can't we will just stop the machine and revert back to the previous snapshot uh, although in between we stopped all writes to the system so pg bouncer was stopped and platform was taken down uh we are still trying to find a way to do it in production because in production we can't take uh, that long downtime in production we have to be really swift with this uh one way that we thought of was since our customer base is mostly eu we can probably take a downtime where our traffic metrics are really low uh although there would be connection severances but yes so this uh, this was our story uh with the pg upgrade tool uh it's a great tool so we jumped we were a bit apprehensive about jumping two major versions but it worked out really well uh although the tool says that uh, please go for go from like hop one version at a time uh, don't go two versions uh so yeah uh, on on the on the sql fire side we have an interesting story uh so once uh, one of our engineers ran an update query without setting the where clause so basically without any filter and that rewrote the whole tables one one of the columns uh the silver lining here is the table was not a like business data table it was more like application metadata so we were a bit safe in that sense that had just like i think 50ish rows it was a very small table but then the problem was we did not have the data anywhere uh even the replica had the data updated basically the query had transferred into the replica the uh, records were gone so we thought hey uh since the dead tuples would still be there on the hard, on the disk we basically uh, read the dirty pages from disk and fortunately we had someone in the team who had very good understanding of the postgres internals how does postgres read pages so that person basically wrote a program which read that page and then like to a to a very well defined extent of human interpretation got the data in a form and then we we just entered the data into the table by hand since we saw that we saw when reading the binary page we could comprehend the data uh, this was one war story and the second one i don't know if if it's a war story or not but it's probably more like not knowing what to do what not to do with pg someone sick killed the postmaster and there was a havoc into the whole system uh, and since this this is like a very inadvertent state uh, yeah the engineer eventually learned that uh, they should not do a sick kill on the postmaster uh but yeah uh, thanks for listening to me uh, for the last few minutes thanks for sharing that because it's very rare to find people who understand like the postgres from the top to the bottom where you can read the pages and how it is b plus trees everything getting back to that is not something you can do it in pressure but i don't know how long it took to come back to that state if you can share that it would be much more interesting uh so to give you a context it was around 7 o'clock in the evening when this happened uh, everyone just wrapping up their stuff and going back home uh, 
uh, suddenly engineer just shrieked out aloud that hey uh, i think i did a mistake i think i did an update query without setting the uh, filter and uh, we got the data back by 9 o'clock like 2 hours it took so the idea struck really fast so the first thing that we tried out was let's see if the replication lag was really high the replay lag was high so that the secondary would still have the data we can just severe the replication then and there and still get back the data from secondary but the problem was that the replication was running really fine so there were really less number of like update queries or insert queries that replication was pristine that uh, so yeah that was our first thought the second thought was hey now let's go by the basics that since it's a uh, since pg does not modify the existing tuples pg rewrite like adds a new tuple and then changes the ct id let's go that way so that's where that this idea came from that if the page is still if we can somehow find the page and disk uh, we could get it back so finding the page took a bit of time understanding it was a bit easier because we had that engineer who knew postgres internals uh, so that was a couple of very nice a couple of things here yeah so go ahead yeah, sorry join late um, but one thing that came to my mind is why can't you try point in time recovery uh the problem with pitr there is we have lots of data so we do we do a different form of pitr but we just snapshot the disks uh so to a certain extent of delta time delta we can get back the data but not to like hey uh, can i get the data to a second granularity uh, we don't do that as a conscious decision so, no, uh, anyone wants to read uh, a little more about what nabun was talking about the pupils and how postgres does right uber has a very famous story on why they migrated away from postgres and into a uh, toward mysql uh, postgres team did a later uh, rebuttal uh but it also uh, points to the same fact that uh, hey anand would you mind muting yourself sorry uh it also uh, is to do with the fact that postgres does not actually do uh, in place writes it uh, writes a whole new uh, row uh, and then changes the id uh which is the same same thing that number one and team tries it was able to use uh that particular story the postgres rebuttal and uh, uber's original blog post are, are quite illustrative reads I strongly recommend people to go read them. Uh, secondly, uh, I think we, we've been talking about PG upgrade uh, quite a bit. The reason PG upgrade is so good, uh, there are two reasons. One is it's part of the Postgres build process. Any point release or any RC uh, release does not go out before uh, PG upgrade is run on that. Every incremental uh, upgrade uh, goes through a PG upgrade test. and so every every single commit that goes to postgres is 100% upgrade compatible uh, <coughs> that also sort of speaks uh, about the postgres uh, core teams uh, uh, commitment to stay true to the the core relational model uh, and also be like very forward looking uh, one of the reasons why postgres is so good and revered is the fact that the core team will not make Uh, easy compromises for the sake of performance or, or for the sake of operational benefits they'll stay uh, true to the core model and that reflects uh, you know all, all the decisions uh let's it i have one another uh, one more war story you know, to share if, uh if anyone else uh, i'll give them a chance uh, if not i'll go ahead and share please go ahead uh cool so this one is slightly different uh, it's not a operational it's about uh, again uh, data model and understanding data types uh so this is from one of my consulting projects uh and again i uh, unfortunately can't share a lot of details but uh, i'm assuming people here have worked with serial or auto incrementing ids uh, can we do like a quick show of hands or something or uh, i assume like anybody who's worked with active record and django Uh, or in general any modern uh, postgres system uh, they would have worked with auto incrementing ids and uh, and so this project i was working on they also uh, ha- had all their integer primary keys as auto incrementing however instead of treating 
the integer iris as just a unique value. Uh, this team made a mistake of relying on the fact that these IDs are auto incrementing and therefore they would be serial in nature. Uh, two very different things. Uh, and so, so the let, let me talk about the lesson from this story first and then we'll talk about what went wrong uh, a little bit. So, so the lesson here uh, is that if you're using a particular data type, like what are your invariants? Uh, whenever you write something or, or we design the schema or, or, or give a data type or give a type to something, we need to look at the invariant uh, of, of that data type or, or that assumption, right? What is always true about the integer uh, ID, for example, right? And, and what is always true about the integer unique key auto incrementing is that it is unique and it is integer. And that's it. And that, those are the only things, two things that are true about it. The fact that it is auto incrementing uh, does not play into uh, uh, the, the core invariant of that model. And so uh, now, now coming back to the war story, what happened was they had certain assumptions built into their model and on, on in their business logic that incrementing ID means something. Uh, they, they treated it as like a series. And there were things like aggregations and stuff, uh, order by clauses built on ID. Uh, and so uh, this was all fine when they were operating on a reasonably low, a low uh, scale, uh, no risk conditions, etc. things were okay. Uh, then they started growing uh, and infrastructure was running at pretty high capacity. And now what happens is if you have uh, the, the serial ID in particular uh, does not survive a rolled back transaction, for example. Uh, if you, if you, let's say there's a column, uh, primary key ID, uh, and you inserted a record, uh, in a table within a transaction. Uh, and now you, after that, you rolled back your transaction, you are not going to get the, the old ID back. The ID would have moved on, uh, because, uh, because the IDs are part of a sequence and a sequence once consumed does not go back. It's not rolled back. So let's say your current maximum ID is, uh, 10,000 and you started a transaction, you created a record with 10,001 and then that record was rolled back. Uh, the next ID will be 10,002 and not 10,000 ag back again. And so this particular fact, uh, this team did not understand because it's not apparent. It's not easy. The documentation doesn't say it. Uh, very similar to uh, the transaction uh, wraparound problem. And so uh, these assumptions ended up uh, costing data inaccuracies because obviously the moment you say the ID is serial, uh, one comes after one another, it's no longer true. And so all your reports, everything that you built based on this assumption is no longer true. And so they ended up, uh, so the cost uh, that they paid was pretty dear. Like they lost a couple of customers, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, and they ended up uh, suffering uh, as a consequence of this. But, but the lesson learned was this, that if, you, if you're designing something, you need, you need to look at the invariants uh, for, for that particular uh, data type or, or anything for that matter. Uh, that's it. That's the story. Thanks, Swanan. And that's also interesting because like uh, there are configuration where you can get back the IDs, but uh, stating what you said, like it is also not a good practice because uh, as you say, if customer ID gets changed, then it can cause like a lot of, uh, as you said, like a lot of havocs. Exactly. Yep. This actually is a, like this particular pattern is a favorite uh, thing of mine that I keep talking even in my workshop, uh, I talk about quite a bit is invariant based design. Like mm -hmm. when you're designing something, you write down the invariants first, like what doesn't change no matter what happens. And then you sort of build up your design uh, based on that. Uh, UUID is uh, in, a, in a way, uh, sp uh, speaking specifically about primary keys, UUIDs help you sort of go over uh, or overcome this particular problem, but they have their own problems. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, that that was the that was story I had to share.